In this video, we'll do a fairly lengthy example involving a parameter study on a special electrical circuit called the Wheatstone Bridge. A Wheatstone Bridge is commonly used to measure an unknown resistance. It consists of two main branches. One branch goes through R2 and R4, and the other branch goes through R1 and R5. R1, R2, and R4 are usually known, and R4 is usually adjustable. R5 is typically unknown. When the ratio of R2 to R4 equals the ratio of R1 to R5, there is no potential difference between these two points, and therefore there is no current flowing across R3. When this occurs, the bridge is said to be balanced. A typical application of a Wheatstone bridge is with strain gauges. Let's say R5 is the resistor in a strain gauge, and all the resistances are initially equal. In this case, the bridge is balanced, and there is no voltage or current across R3. But when the strain gauge is stretched or compressed, it changes the value of R5, and now there is a voltage and a current flowing across R3 because the bridge is now unbalanced. The amount of voltage across R3 is related to the deformation of the strain gauge, so engineers can determine how much the gauge displaced based on what voltage they measure from the Wheatstone bridge. You can analyze a circuit based on KVL and KCL. These three equations were generated from KVL, which states that the sum of the voltages around a closed loop is zero. The first equation traces this rectangular loop passing through V, R2, and R4. The second equation is derived from the loop encompassing R1 through R3. The third equation is derived from the loop encompassing R3 to R5. We also have four more equations down here stemming from KCL. KCL states that the incoming currents at a node must equal the outgoing currents. When applying KCL, you should pay attention to the directions of the currents. All of these arrows are actually assumed directions. I can't guarantee that I3, for instance, flows to the left. When we solve the system of equations, the sign of the answer will tell us whether we correctly assume the directions of the current flow. If we get a negative answer for I3, the magnitude of the current is correct, but the current will actually be flowing to the right. It's like a statics problem. Another important fact is that we have seven equations total, but we only have six unknown currents. That means we can eliminate one of these four equations because they more or less convey the same information. Let's just eliminate the last equation. That'll give us six equations with six unknowns, which is what we want. The objective of this problem is to solve the system of equations to find the unknown currents. We'll do so within the MATLAB function we create. We'll embed that function at the bottom of a driver script which performs various case studies on the Wheatstone bridge using the function. We'll also use the driver script to perform two parameter studies. In part D, we see how the currents within the Wheatstone bridge are affected when we change the applied voltage. In part E, we see how the currents change if we change R1. Before we do any coding, we should gain a better physical understanding of how the Wheatstone bridge itself translates into a linear system. This is done through the cause-effect diagram. From earlier videos, you know that the cause-effect diagram maps the physical system to the A, B, and X vectors. The forcing function is the applied voltage V because it supplies the electrical equivalent of an external force to the Wheatstone bridge. The resistors and assumed direction of the currents comprise the system parameters, and the six unknown currents comprise the response variables. We did all of this without yet converting any of the seven equations into AX equals B form. The cause-effect diagram was obtained solely from our understanding of the Wheatstone bridge and common sense. Now that we have the cause-effect diagram and better understand how the equations relate to the A, X, and B vectors, we should form them by hand. I migrated the equations to a separate document for cleanliness. Remember that we chose to eliminate the last equation because it's linearly dependent. Let's rearrange each of the six remaining equations so that I1 comes first and I6 comes last. If an equation is missing any of the i's, we'll precede it with a coefficient of zero. If any i has a coefficient of one, we'll write in the one. This will help us maintain consistency and structure while we form the a, b, and x matrices. Starting with the first equation, we should move all the i terms to the right-hand side, since the v is a constant which represents our forcing function. We only have coefficients attached to the i2 and the i4 terms, so this row will have lots of zeros attached to the missing i coefficients. Be sure to work slowly through this part. Flipping just one sign can be disastrous. Now let's do the second equation. 
we don't have any coefficients attached to the i4 through i6 terms. I'm going to swap the positions of the first two terms here so that the i1 term comes first. Double check that you have the minus sign here. Now for the third equation. The remaining three equations are all expressed in terms of i. This makes writing them out pretty easy, but we'll also have quite a few negatives thrown in. I like to keep i1 positive at all times if possible, so for the fourth equation, I'll move i6 over to the right hand side. I think you get the hang of it, so I'll crank out the last two equations at once. And there we have it. Be sure to triple and quadruple check your work. This is the hardest and most painstaking part. Now that we've ordered the equations, it should be pretty easy to see A, B, and X. The A matrix will include the zeros, ones, and r's, which are the system parameters. The X vector contains the six unknown currents, and the B vector contains the applied voltage from the first equation. This is consistent with the cause-effect diagram we generated earlier, except now we can confirm it using the equations. Now that we have A, B, and X drawn out by hand, all we need to do is transcribe it in MATLAB. Here we are in the blank script file. Part B wants us to write a function to solve the Wheatstone bridge problem, so let's jump down to the bottom where the function needs to be. The function is very creatively named Wheatstone bridge function. Don't forget to add the corresponding end keyword. It accepts two inputs, V and R. V is a scalar representing the applied voltage. R is a vector containing R1 through R5. You could argue that it might be smarter to supply R1 through R5 as individual inputs to the function, but I prefer to supply one vector containing all the resistances because it preserves generality. If you have a very complex Wheatstone bridge problem involving, say, a thousand resistors, you'd have to type in each resistor every time you call the function. That would obviously be an intractable amount of work, so giving the function a vector of resistances instead is the preferred method. The output of the function is i, which is a vector containing i1 through i6. Hopefully the pre-written documentation here is clear. We already assembled a, b, and x by hand, so we just need to copy it into MATLAB. Because this is a pretty large system, I'm going to write one part, test it, and then write the next part instead of doing it all in one fell swoop. This helps me debug if I make a mistake, and also forces me to work slowly, which is always good to do when coding. I included some tab spaces in between each entry in the A matrix just so it looks more square. When I was typing in the A matrix, I accidentally put a negative in front of the R5 but corrected myself when I was triple checking my work. This just goes to show the importance of checking your work often. Now that I have the A matrix, I'm going to test it just to make sure we punched everything in correctly. I'll do this in the first part of the driver. I made up the r and v values just for testing purposes. The r vector has very large numbers, all of which are different, so you can easily tell which number gets mapped where within the A matrix. 
Take a minute to verify that the A matrix is correct. Check all of the minus signs and R values. Now that we've verified the A matrix, we can go back down to the function to write the B vector. I ended up suppressing the A matrix because we think it's correct, so there's no need to continuously print it to the command window. However, you can leave it unsuppressed if you want. The B vector contains the given voltage in the first element and zeros everywhere else, which is what we want. Now we can finish writing the function. And now we've obtained some numbers in our x vector. Although there is no way to check if these numbers are correct just from a quick glance, their presence hints to us that we're at least on the right track. To recap, we started solving this linear algebra problem involving a Wheatstone bridge. We meticulously formed the a, b, and x vectors by hand before pecking away at MATLAB. Once we confirmed the cause-effect diagram using our handwritten a, b, and x vectors, we carefully transcribed them into MATLAB while laboriously testing along the way. In the next part, we'll use the function we just wrote within our driver script to perform numerous case studies and parameter studies. See you next time.